This is the <coughs> continuation of the lecture I did whenever that was last, th I don't even know. What? Last week was Thanksgiving, so I guess it was a week ago on Tuesday. Okay, so again, we're talking about this idea of multivariable systems. And just to refresh your memory, we're talking about something like this. So there's some process, let's call it P, and there's more than one input, and there's more than one output. And so the picture I'm drawing now tells you that there's N things that we can manipulate, and there's also N things that we want to control. So we call this an N by N system. Typically, we're going to work with systems that are, tend to be two by two, two inputs, two outputs, because they're easier to work with. Okay? But, so this is the problem we're trying to, to work on. And so the idea here, conceptually, which I showed you last time, was that we'll use one of these inputs to control one of these outputs. Okay? So once we decide which input we're going to use to control which output, then we just design a controller in the usual way to do that. Okay? Um, and the key thing is how are we going to go about deciding how to pair these inputs with these outputs to do the control. And last time we also talked about this thing called the transfer function matrix. And that relates um, ah. Okay, so it's the same thing you've seen before. An output equals, I mean, you multiply the input by the transfer function, that's the output in the Laplace domain. But in this case, if u and y are vectors, then this g is actually a matrix. And for example, if it's a 2x2 two, two two system, then this matrix looks like this. It has four entries, and, for, and the indices here tell you the second one is what the input is, and the first one is what the output is. So this one relates the second input to the first output. Okay? So for example, if I decide I'd like to pair um, u1 and y1 together, and u2 and y2, that means I'm going to use that transfer function there to design that controller, and I'm going to use this transfer function here to design that controller. I'm just going to pretend like these aren't even there. Good job. Did anyone? Look at you suspiciously? No. Okay. Life, we have good security. All right. All right, so this, this is the problem that we were, we're facing. And so at this point, we're trying to figure out how we're going to go about pairing these variables. Last time, I just tried to convince you if you don't pair them right, you can have a lot of problems. So that the point of today is how to pair them. The tool we're going to use is something called the RGA, Relative Gain Array. It's all based on steady state information, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so I'm going to first of all define it, and then I'll show you how you can use it to define um, input-output <coughs> uh, pairings. I seem to be kind of tired, sorry. Um, so this is all based on steady state considerations, so I will talk a little bit about dynamics and how that might think change your thinking a little bit about this. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about tuning, and then um, how you might actually design the system to reduce interactions by choice of variables. I better get these now before it's too late. All right. So that's where we're headed. Um, so I already said this, right? Pair the variables together, design a controller for each pair. Um, the goal is to try to make sure these controllers have as little interaction as possible. Because when we do use, let's say, these two transfer functions to do the design of the controller, and we're essentially in the design process pretending like these transfer functions don't exist, when we actually turn both controllers on at the same time, they interact with each other, right? Because the input u not only affects y1, but it also, um, well, it also affects uh, y2 through this transfer <coughs> function, okay? Um, and so last time I went through that whole scenario of what might happen due to these interactions. So the goal is to try to make these interactions small in some sense that I'm going to define in a moment, okay? Um, and so the idea here is that in many cases, some cases you can kind of look at the physics of the problem or you know, the structure of the problem, and you can pair the variables based on physical considerations. Sometimes you can't. Um, if the system is large, there's lots of pairings. So, you know, it goes as the f factorial, the number of pairings. So obviously, if you have two, it's a two by two system, you have two possibilities. That's not too bad. If you get three, you have six possibilities, right? It grows pretty quickly and can get pretty complex. Um, once we um, design these controllers, 
and they're the idea is we're going to design each controller so it works by itself, then we'll turn them on at the same time. And then they may not work as well together when they're on at the same time because they interact with each other, and that may dictate you detune the controllers. You, remember last time I tried to detune the controllers and proved unsuccessful? <laughs> but th that's the general idea. All right. So here's your, got to be your favorite example of all chemical engineering after separations and design, the old distillation column, right? So everyone knows how it works. You put feed into the column. You um, have vapor going up the column because you have the circuit down here that takes liquid through a reboil and creates vapor. And you have liquid coming down the column because you have this overhead circuit where you condense the liquid and put it back in the column. Okay, or condense the vapor, I should say. And so we're all familiar with this. And if we look at this problem from a control perspective, you can think of the things you might want to control, which I've listed here. I should call this controlled outputs, not controller, but I love, I love real-time, real-time modification of slides. Hey, don't send emails to me right now. All right, there you go. Okay, so if we look at this problem, you say, well, what would we like to control? In the next lecture, I'm going to give you some idea about how one systematically goes about choosing these, or at least introduce the idea. But as you might imagine, this is a separation process, so we're probably interested in the composition of the two streams coming out of the column, the overhead stream and the bottom stream. Okay, so that's where this comes from. Um, we're going to be interested always in any control problem of controlling inventories, right? So you have an overhead drum here, and you have a reboiler. Well, actually you have um, liquid in the bottom of the column here. These hold inventory, and these have to be controlled. You just can't let these levels just wander around aimlessly, because you'll end up with no um, liquid in the bottom of the column, for example, then you can't create any vapor. Then you're screwed. That's a technical term, all right? Same thing in the overhead circuit. You've got to have, have liquid here in order to create reflux to go back in the column. So we're going to want to control the levels in, these, in the drum and in the bottom of the column. That's these two things. And it would be wise to control the pressure of the column because hopefully, you know from VLE, the separation you get is dictated by the temperature but also the pressure. And so if we want to have reproducible separation in this column, it's a good idea to, to control this overhead pressure here, and therefore that'll create a pressure distribution in the column that um, should be fairly constant and should lead to s separation that's pretty consistent. Uh, have you ever looked at the pressure or temperature distribution in a column, like an aspen or anything, in separations? Okay. So hopefully you know the um, temperature obviously goes um, down, well, the temperature is highest in the bottom of the column, and so is the pressure, right? They both decrease as you go up the column. So by fixing the pressure here, we can, for the most part, fix the pressure distribution in the column, and that will um, help you get a more consistent separation. Okay, so those are things we'd like to control. And so if you want to control five things, you better have th five things you can manipulate. And so you can see there's valves. Um, how many valves do we have? One, two, three, four, five. I bet those are the five things we manipulate. <laughs> okay. So what, we're going to um, manipulate duty to the reboiler here, okay, that's Q, duty to the condenser up here, that's the QD, we're going to manipulate the reflux back to the column, and the two product streams, dissolute product stream and bottom product stream. All right, now, first thing I'll mention is that, so the number of, because this is the number of pairings, you have 120 possibilities, okay? So one, one approach is to enumerate all 120 possibilities and, and run them, you know. That's kind of not very efficient, obviously. Um, so you'd like some way of getting a smaller number, obviously, if you could. Some of these pairings don't make any sense and you would never think about doing them. So somebody said, I would like to control the overhead um, composition here. A ridiculous choice would be I'll manipulate the bottom's flow rate. Right? I mean, it will have an effect, right? But it'll have to propagate all the way up the column, and that's not a good idea. So, for the most part, if you want to control the distillate composition, you're going to use some manipulated variable in the overhead circuit, because they're physically close to each other. That would be either that one, that one, or that one. Okay? Same thing for the bottoms. 
But even then, you've got a lot of possibilities, because that's a little three by three system, of which there's three factorial possibilities, which is what? Six? Duh. And down here's a little two by two system. The possibilities there is two. So I guess there's like 12 possibilities that make sense to me. All right, well, um, so what we need here is some way of screening these possibilities. So even if we get it from 120 to down to 12 or something, it makes sense. That's still a lot. And you wouldn't want to have to evaluate all those. So that's what we're looking for, to something to screen. Okay, Someone, something that gives us an idea that we have a good pairing, and then we can do more detailed analysis after that. The tool we're going to use to do that is something called the relative gain. Um, it's called the relative gain because it's a ratio of two gains. Okay, And what it does is it quantifies um, how much the gain changes when you turn other controllers on, which I'll explain this in a minute. So to read this, quantifies the change in steady state gain between an input output pair that occurs when the other control loops are closed. Okay, The idea is that, let's say you have a two by two system. You have a controller one and controller two. Okay, um, if, controllers turn, if controllers two is turned off, then you, the only gain that matters is the steady state gain between controller one and two. Well, here, here's the what I just said makes no sense. <laughs> Scratch that from your memory. All right, let's go b back here. Uh, what was this one called? Okay, this is for your edification here. You may recall that I did the following. So this is the, this is the problem we're dealing with, right? So we pair the variables together, use u1 to control y1 and u2 to control y2. But the problem is there's this interactions that occurs between the control that's shown in this dark line here. And last time I went through the analysis of this and showed you that if, the, uh, if that second controller is turned off, the, the transfer function between y1 and u1 is just what you'd want it to be, th th this thing right here. Okay? That's what you design the controller on. That's great. If the other controllers turn on at the same time, that changes the effective transfer function between u1 and y1 because now there's this new path of which u1 can affect y1, this circuitous thing here. And if you do the analysis then, you see that now this is the transfer function between y1 and u1. It's different. Okay? So the same thing, if you're, just, if you're not worried about um, transfer functions but just gains, then you know that's easy enough to get. Just set all these transfer functions to zero and you'll see the gain changes depending on whether the other controller is on or not. Okay, so that's what we're trying to characterize with this relative gain, but we're trying to do it a, in a more general way than just for this case. So that's, that's the kind of the background or the idea. All right. So the first thing you have to, this is like a 12-step program, the first thing you have to do is admit that the gain changes. Okay. Um, <laughs> The gain changes if you turn the other controller on, step one, okay? Um, and so what we're trying to do here is get a measure of how much this gain changes if the other controller's turned on, and we do that with something called the relative gain, okay? Now, try not to be confused about these indices here. The first index just means what output you're talking about, and the se second index means what input you're talking about. So this, this, you calculate this in principle for every input-output pair, okay? And that's what this says. So I'm, uh, I didn't use this notation a lot, but it just, you may know what this means or not, it just means i is an index and it can assume values between 1 and n. Okay? So, you know, we're going to calculate lambda 1, 1, and lambda 1, 2, and lambda 1, 3, and lambda 2, 1, and lambda 2, and so on and so forth. Okay? All right, so this is the ratio of two gains. So I have to explain to you what these gains are. One of them, you already know what it is. Okay? That's this thing up here. So you see, first of all, why am I saying partial derivatives? Well, if I told you that, for example, y1 was equal, yeah, that's a steady state model, right? It tells you how u1 and u2 affect y1 at steady state. Those are, the, those are gains, okay? If I ask, one way to recover this thing here, right? is if I ask you, what is the gain between, I want to know the gain between y1 and u1, then I can do this. You follow that? So I take this equation, I take the derivative with respect to u1, 
and I'm not allowing you, this means I'm not allowing you two to change, especially not, it's not a function of U1, okay? Then I recover the value K11. It's just a general way of saying the gain between Y1 and U1, okay? And the key thing here is that what we're assuming is that all the other inputs are not changing. So what this subscript means is the other controllers are turned off. They're not on. That's what you mean by U being constant, okay? All right, and that's, the, that's just the gain, that's just the, uh, that's the gain you would always think of, okay? Just the gain between U, uh, U1 and Y1, for example, okay? The, the denominator is the different thing, okay? It says, what is the gain between, let's say, Y1 and U1 where, when all the other outputs are held constant? So what this says is the other controllers are turned on, okay? And they're controlling the outputs essentially perfectly, let's say, okay? So this one is, I want to know the gain where all the other controllers are turned off and the U's are constant, okay? That's the gain you always think about. And then there's this new gain, which is what is the gain between the output and the input when all the other outputs are held constant? not inputs, meaning the other out, the controllers are essentially performing their job perfectly, the other controllers, okay? So I will often call this thing the open loop gain, it's the gain you always think about, and I'll call this thing the closed loop gain. They're not the same. Just like the, I won't go back to the slide, but I showed you how the transfer function changed depending if, if u was constant or, or y was constant. So this is the same thing, but it's steady state, okay? All right. So this is the definition. The key thing here is you have to understand, this tells you how much the gain is changing if all the controllers are turned off relative to if they're turned on, okay? So for example, if you turn the other, let's say you have a two by two system, this is the gain between Y1 and U1, you turn the other controller on and the gain doesn't change, then this thing will be one. It says turning the other controller on has no effect at steady state at all. That's, that's awesome, that's what you'd want, okay? And I'll go through all the possibilities. But you, so you have to have some intuitive idea. I'll show you an easy way to calculate this in a second, right? Okay. But you have to have some intuitive idea of what this, this means. All right. Good. So here's a, a simple way of calculating. And in the next slide, I'll show you a general way. But let's say you have these two steady state models, right? This looks just like our transfer function models, except instead of transfer functions, we have gains. Same thing. Okay. And we know we can always get the gain from a transfer function by just setting s equals zero on the transfer function, you can get the gain. But okay, so we have these two steady state models. The k is the gains, first subscript output, second subscript input, okay? We have four gains because we have two inputs and two outputs. All right, what is the open loop gain? For example, let's say we want to calculate um, what is the gain between y1 and u1, open loop, meaning we're going to hold u2 constant. I just showed you on the board up there. That's just k11. Okay. In other words, take the partial derivative of this thing, which gives you the gain. This thing doesn't contribute anything. You just recover k11. Okay. All right. So now what you want to do is compute the same thing, but now you want to hold y2 constant. Okay. Right. Because we're dealing with deviation variables, constant means zero. Okay. So now we want to calculate the same derivative, but now we want to have y2 be zero. Okay. Well, that's a constraint. You have to impose that constraint somehow, and that's what I'm doing here. So I'm setting y2 equals 0, and then I'm solving this equation right here for u2 in terms of u1, and then I'm taking that u2 right there and plugging it in right there, okay? And if you do that, you get this equation right here. It tells you, looks like the gain between y1 and u1 is something different now than it was, okay? And so this is the effective gain between U1 and Y1 if the other output is held constant. It's different than that, okay? So now it's pretty easy. Now simply take this partial derivative which gives you the gain. You've already enforced this idea that Y2 has to be zero, okay? And then you get this thing here. So you can see this is composed of two parts, right? So it's composed of just K11, which is that open loop gain, then this whole minus all these gains is, is what happens because these things might interact with each other, okay? All right, so now if you wanna know the relative gain, you just take the ratio of that thing in the numerator and that thing in the denominator, which is what I've written here. The K11 cancels and you get that thing, okay? So the way to think about this, as I'll explain in a minute, is that if this number is one, that's, that's ideal. Because that says the gain doesn't change whatsoever if you turn the other controller on, right? Because you understand the implication here is that we're gonna design the controller 
with the other con ignoring the other controller, right? So we'll design a controller for U1 and Y1 assuming the other controller doesn't exist. If we turn on the other controller and it changes the gain between our U1 and Y1, that's going to screw up our controller tuning badly, <coughs> right? Because the gain is going to be a lot different than we thought when we designed the controller. And that's going to have bad implications. And you saw, remember that um, picture I showed you last time of, it was a, a kind of a made-up example, but it showed you when the system was stable as a function of the two controller gains and it was this really thin envelope, okay? So that's the kind of thing we're trying to recognize and avoid if possible. Okay, so again, if this thing is 1, then that means the gain hasn't changed at all. If it's different than 1, that means by turning the other controller on, we've changed the gain. And if this gain has changed a lot, it's going to be a problem because the controller tuning will be bad, okay? All right, so this is, this is fine. Um, it gives you, hopefully, some idea of, of what this means. But it's not very scalable, this approach, right? So if I gave you a system of five inputs and five outputs, you, would, you wouldn't want to do this approach. It's too laborious, okay? So here's the general approach here, okay? So I'm just writing it in vector matrix form. So Y is a vector of outputs. We'll assume we have N of them. U is a vector of inputs. Again, N of them. This is what's known as a square system, okay? And again, hopefully you appreciate that if we want to control n outputs to a set point, we need at least n inputs. Otherwise, we don't have enough degrees of freedom. We might, you can have more if you want. I could control three outputs with 10 inputs if I wanted. You don't know how to do it, but you can do it from a degree of freedom standpoint. But um, you've got to have at least the same number. And at this point, we're always assuming they're the same. Okay. So now we have a gain matrix. <coughs> and as usual, there's a lot of indexes here. But this is just all the gains between this group of inputs and this group of outputs. So for example, this entry here is the gain between the first input and the first output. This gain here is the last input, first output, and so on and so forth. So it's just, it's just a matrix. The indices, the, the notation of the subscripts is what we always use for a matrix, right? It's nothing new. So it's just a matrix of gains. All right, so let's say that you would like to calculate the relative gain array, or matrix, I should say. I haven't used the word array yet. Um, for a system that looks like this, so it's not two by two. If it's two by two, that's the answer, okay? But what if it's more than that? This gives you a general way. So it's a, it's a two-step procedure, if you will. First thing is you do the following. You take your gain matrix and you invert it, okay? So that means you have to be able to invert the matrix, okay? That precludes me giving you a problem on a test that's five by five as well, right? Because you can't invert a five by five matrix by hand, or probably can't, okay? So, but this is, this is uh, amenable to doing in MATLAB, right? Because that's a single command, just invert a matrix. Hopefully this matrix is not it's singular or you're, you're in trouble, okay? So invert this matrix, and then once you get the inverse, then take the transpose of that inverse, right? That means just switch the rows and the columns. And once you do that, I'm going to define the resulting matrix to be H, because that's what I want to call it. And I'm just telling you this is the components of that matrix. Same notation I use here, except instead of K, it's H. Okay? Now, let's say I want to know the relative gain between, let's just say, to make it simpler for now, I want to know lambda 1, 1. What is the relative gain between the first output and the first input? Okay? Then you take K, 1, 1. Okay? That means that element right there of the K matrix, and then multiply it by H11. This is a scalar multiplication. You're not multiplying the matrices. You're multiplying the components of the matrix. So then I multiply it times that, and then I get the relative gain for between U1 and Y1. If you check this, you'd see you get the same thing. I just calculate if the system is two by two, okay? So this works really well if the problem is large, okay? And um, it requires, of course, you can invert the matrix, okay? All right, so if I want to say anything more about that, not really. So now what I need to do is tell you what you do when you get this, these lambdas. <laughs> we calculate all these lambdas, what are, what are we going to do with them, okay? With this procedure, you can calculate lambda between any input-output pair, right? Because th there's the formula. Take the K matrix, do this, get the H matrix, multi do scalar multiplication of the elements of K and H and get any lambda you want. Lambda 20, comma 21, whatever. Okay? So you can get the lambdas now. All right. So 
this shouldn't come as any surprise to you, but once we get all these lambdas, we're going to put them in a matrix, okay? We're going to put them in a matrix called, unless I screwed up, capital lambda, okay? And it's going to be a matrix comprised of all these lambdas that we calculated for each input-output pair. So that's the lambda between U1 and Y1. This is the one between UN and Y1 and so on. Just put them in a matrix, okay? If the system is two by two, then it'll look like this, right? It'll, you'll have four lambdas. Otherwise, you'll have a lot of lambdas. The number of lambdas is um, n squared. Okay? All right. There is one good thing about this that I haven't told you that I won't prove either, but it's that every... So this thing here is called the relative gain array. Okay? That's called a relative gain, and this thing is called the relative gain array. Array is another word for matrix. That I, I use matrix, but traditionally they use array here. It means the same thing. Relative gain matrix call. Okay? All right, what I haven't told you, but it's true and I won't prove it, is that a property of this relative gain array is that every column and every row must sum to one. Okay? So what does that mean? That means, for example, in this case, if I can compute lambda 1, 1, the rest of them are determined because this row has to sum to one. That's a column, actually. This column has to sum to one in that row and this column. Okay, so that means so if you can calculate lambda 1, 1, the rest of the matrix has to look like this. Because that way, every row and every column sums to one, okay? And so, at this point, I kind of only have to calculate one lambda, so I'm tired of the subscript, so I might just call that thing lambda, you see? Because I, I only have a one one now because of this property, so maybe just call that thing lambda, all right? If the thing is, if it's a bigger problem than this, you just have to calculate n minus one elements every row and column and you'll know the last one. It's like mole fractions, right? You don't calculate all the mole fractions. <laughs> you just calculate n minus one of them and then you know the other one because it's, they have to sum to one. Same thing here. All right. So now we're at the magical point when I can tell you why we're doing this, right? Because now we have this big matrix of relative gains and we kind of know that each element corresponds to how much the gain changes between that input and output pair, okay? So for, just to say this, reiterate this again, what does this number here mean? It says, how much does the gain between U1 and Y1 change when all the other controllers are turned on, N minus one of them, okay? That's what you're trying to conclude. And if that gain changes a lot, you're not going to be happy. That's what it comes down to. All right. So here's all the possibilities. So let's just do a two, let's say just we have a two by two problem here. Okay, so we, it looks like this, because all columns and rows have to sum to one. There's the definition of lambda, how, what the open loop gain is relative to the closed loop gain. And I enumerate here five cases and go through them one by one. The ideal case is lambda is one. Okay, that means that the gain, the open loop gain and the closed loop gain are identical to each other. It doesn't change at all if you turn the other controllers on. That's the best possible scenario. Okay, so here's what we're going to generally do. We're going to form this matrix or this array and then we're going to use it to figure out how to pair the variables. If you look at this array, and I'll give you an example in a minute, but if you look at this array and you see a number that's one in it, that right away you want to pair those variables together because that's the best possible scenario. Okay? So just for the sake of argument, which I'll get into more in a moment, let's say you got a two by two problem and um, was well, pretty. This is a pretty extreme case. You won't usually see this. Let's say you got this situation here. Okay. This says, well, that's the ideal scenario. This is the relative gain between what u two and y one, and this one is between u one and y two. So that says immediately you should pair those things together. Okay. We'll we'll go through this more. But the idea is you're going to look at these elements, you're going to try to determine if you pair them together. And if you see a lambda equals 1, that means the two variables that are associated with that value of lambda, in this case we're assuming lambda 1, 1, should be paired together. Okay? Here is the next to worst possible scenario, the lambda 0. Okay? That means you have some gain, um, well, let me put it a different way. So what is this ratio of the open loop gain to the closed loop? That means the open loop gain is 0. So in other words, the only reason U1 affects Y1 is because the other controllers are turned on. It doesn't have any effect if the controllers are turned off. That's not a good strategy for control, right? It's like this input has no effect on this output unless I turn the other controllers on. 
and then it affects them through those other controllers. Well, that's a bad idea, okay? So if you were to see this, then you wouldn't pair them together. The idea of a real problem is that you're typically not gonna see it exactly equal to one, exactly equal to lambda um, zero, but the idea is that if it's close to one, clo you know what quotes means in science, right? It means we don't know what close means, okay. Um, close to one, then you pair them together. If it's not close to one, then you don't, okay? So in other words, if you saw a number 0.9, that's close to one. If you saw a number 0.1, that's not close to one. Then you wouldn't pair them together. We'll go through an example of this. Okay. All right, let's say um, that you calculate this lambda and it's greater than one. In other words, that tells you that the open loop gain is larger than the closed loop gain, right? That number is bigger than that number. So when you turn the other controllers on, you made the gain smaller. Is that a problem? It just depends on how much smaller it got or bigger. All right, this number is bigger than this number. Lambda is greater than one. So if lambda is 1.1, that's fine. If lambda is 27.3, that's bad news, okay? So that's why it says if it's close to one, you're okay and you would pair the variables together. Otherwise not, okay? And here's the worst possible scenario here, okay? It says lambda is negative, okay? That means I had a certain gain, let's say it was positive, and I turned the other controllers on and the gain changed sign. Okay, so it was, you know, gain was plus five and now it's minus two. You're guaranteed it'll be unstable when you turn the two controllers on at the same time. Okay, because you designed the controller for a positive gain and now the gain is actually negative when you turn the other controllers on. So this is, this will lead to guaranteed instability of the system. These other things might just lead to really poor performance, but this will lead to guar guarantee to be unstable, okay? So what's the moral of the story after this litany of possibilities is that if the lambda is close to one, that's good. If the lambda is not close to one, it's bad. If lambda is negative, it's tragic, okay? All right, so let's go through an example. Well, I guess I'm not gonna go through an example. This is just, it seemed to be regurgitating the same thing again, again, and again. But anyway, so here's the general rule, all right? So you've got this big, uh, potentially n by n matrix. I just did the two by two case, right? You're gonna have a relative gain between every input output pair, every possibility. And these are the general rules. It just recapitulates what's on the other slide. If the, if the lambda between that input output pair is one, you should pair those two variables together, okay? If um, it's, let's say, between zero and one, but close to one, you should pair them together. If it's not close to one, you should avoid it. If it's greater than one, but close to one, you should consider pairing them together. But if it's greater than one and really much bigger than one, then you shouldn't. <coughs> if it's zero, you definitely shouldn't pair them together because there's no gain between U1 and Y1 unless the other controllers are turned on. And if it's negative, don't put them together or the system will go unstable, okay? All right, so this is all nice and I'll show you how to use it in a minute. I guess I'm gonna derive a little problem here and then I'll show you how to use it. But the one thing you have to remember here is that everything we've done is based on steady state, right? This may seem a little strange because right, the, the first thing I teach you in control is dynamics are the most important thing about control, right? Systems have dynamics and that's why you need control. And then, then now I come here and I say, let's, no, let's forget about dynamics. <laughs> why do we do this? Because it's much more complex to try to do the same type of approach di with dynamics instead of steady state. So the reasoning here is that if you do it at steady state, that should be part of the way in eliminating the interactions dynamically, okay? So in other words, you have two controllers and you can show they don't have hardly any steady state interaction. That's a good sign. Does it guarantee success?